Hello and welcome everybody. I'm Andrea Polera from Sharing Materials, and this is the first session of our Ludo Trauma Edu Chats. Patricia Arbona and I will conduct a series of interviews during the year. Our main aim is to enhance education quality and promote lifelong learning. For this reason, we'll invite educators and great personalities from all around the world. In a comfortable atmosphere, we'll discuss topics which we hope will engage our audience and keep, and keep them interested. Today, we are honored to interview the most inspiring personality for all teachers, Dr. Stephen Krashen. Action speaks louder than words. So, Pat, would you like to kick off? All right. Thank you very much. Well, it's a pleasure for us to have you here today, Dr. Krashen. And uh, everybody knows that it's difficult to start making questions because it is, um, we don't know which to choose uh, to start asking you. But anyway, I think that we could start with one question that I suppose that all teachers are interested in. Um, you know that... Uh, today, English is used as an international language um, for, purposes of, for purposes of communication and uh, there are speakers all around the world who use this language. So today, students are studying the language to be able to communicate around the world. So the question is, um, what is your advice on teaching English effectively today? I, I, well, hello, everybody. Pleasure to be here with you. Um, I'd like to answer that question by telling you a little bit about me and what I am doing now, and I will review the entire work that we've done the last 50 years by telling you a story. I want to tell you what I've been doing during the pandemic. Okay, I have been home the whole time. I tell people I'm home alone with my novia, okay, with my wife. We've only been married 55 years. So it's still very, very good. Okay, we're doing great. And late, late, and I've been working on things. I've been, uh, as you can tell, I've been exercising. Okay, that's why I look so good. I've been drinking lots of coffee. I've been practicing the piano, not just playing. That's been good, getting a little bit better. Uh, I've been doing my work. I was inspired by the great physicist Isaac Newton. Let me tell you about, this is important to hear this, about Isaac Newton. Isaac Newton was not a good student at Cambridge. He was mediocre. Then the plague came, like the pandemic. Isaac Newton went home. He stayed in quarantine on and off for two years. While he was in quarantine, he invented calculus. He did the fundamental work in physics and optics, and we are all profiting from his work. It was magnificent. I'm trying to do the same thing. I'm doing lots and lots of work. It's great fun. And I'm working on my languages. Okay. Right now I'm working on Spanish. <clears throat> and I have to tell you, I'm not very good in Spanish. I'm kind of in the middle. Okay. It's number four for me or number five. But I want to tell you what I'm doing. Uh, every Friday morning, I get up very early and I go shopping. The local supermarket has a special time when you can go at 6.30 in the morning for old people only. That's me. The first time I went, this was more than a year ago, I got all my groceries. I was in line and there was a man helping me and I saw his name. His name was Fidel. And I had heard him speak Spanish. So, of course, I spoke Spanish to him. He answered me in English, which was what you're supposed to do. But I was ready. I said, Fidel, ¿te puedes ayudarme? Mi meta es hablar español como ustedes. He liked that, okay? Hablamos español. So we spoke Spanish. I've been speaking Spanish to Fidel, I would say, every Friday morning for more than a year, but only for two or three minutes because he's working. He's other people. But I can tell... I'm getting better. First of all, he speaks more quickly to me. 
and we have more charlar, okay? We talk about other people, we gossip. Who was it who said, if you don't have anything good to say about somebody, sit next to me. <laughs> so we gossip about other people. And when I see him <clears throat> in the store, <clears throat> we talk, et cetera. <clears throat> and I was talking to a friend of mine, <clears throat> a Mexican-American friend of mine, and I started speaking Spanish to her, which I never did before. She said, Steve, you're so much better. What have you been doing? Well, it's not because of Fidel. I only talked to Fidel for maybe one minute, and that's all. I go home, and I've been reading. I've been taking the advice of my colleague, Benico Mason. I've been reading lots and lots of very, very easy Spanish. Graded readers written for students of Spanish. I can read real Spanish. I read one book by Isabella Allende. It was magnificent. It was a little too hard, okay, for me, but it was so interesting. You kept reading, you know, it was very exciting. But I've been reading these easy books one after another, and I'm getting better. That is my entire speech today. I can stop here. I'm not, it's not from speaking. It's not from study, okay? It's not from getting corrected. It's not from the traditional method. It's not from talking. It's not even from listening. I don't hear that much Spanish. It's from reading these simple, simple, easy, easy books. The graded readers, uh, if you if you um, if you teach English, you know about them. You know the Longman series, the Newberry series. They're okay, but they're getting better. They're becoming literature. I have some favorite authors. One of my favorite authors is a woman named Adriana Ramirez. She's from South America. She lives in Canada. And she writes these stories. I just love them. They're about people and real, real life. I'd like to tell you one of her stories, okay? Give you an idea of what your students can be reading these days, okay? What's going on in graded readers? She tells the story of a young man who has studied Spanish in high school and his Spanish isn't very good. And he's in Bogota. He leaves his hotel to go to another hotel to meet somebody, but he gets lost. And he finds another young man on the street. He says, you know, uh, usted puede ayudarme. He speaks very bad Spanish. And the friend says, where are you going? He says, I'll go with you. It's not very far. On the way, they meet three beautiful young ladies. Good start, right? Yeah. <laughs> the three young ladies come running up to his new friend, give him hugs, give him kisses, okay? And he introduces the young lady to the person telling the story. They give him hugs. They hold his hand. Finally, they go on their way. And his new friend says, well, don't, don't get the wrong idea. We're just friends. I have known these young ladies my entire life. Two of them are my cousins, okay? The other one I met in first grade. This is how we are in Bogota. This is not romance. This is not flirtation. We just are very friendly and warm, and we touch each other. No big deal. So what Adriano Ramirez does in these books, she teaches culture with interesting stories. That's the whole book, one after another, where you think you misunderstand, and then she explains. This is my message today. It's through easy, interesting reading, so interesting you forget that it's in another language. I have been working on myself this way. Uh, my Spanish is still not very good. I'll tell you, Argentinian Spanish, I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't understand anything. <laughs> I, have, I, I speak Mexican Spanish, as you can tell. And not very well. Um, at the synagogue, one of my best friends there is the cantor, the musical director. And he's from Argentina. His mother comes and visits him. And she speaks Argentinian Spanish. She understands me when I speak to her in my Mexican Spanish. But I don't understand her. So we speak Yiddish, the language of my grandparents. Isn't that beautiful? So we have a very good relationship. So someday, when I grow up, I will learn to understand Argentinian Spanish. 
I promise you, okay? So that I've given the entire speech today. The next question um, is really the universal one. We have a lot of evidence that this approach is right. We have evidence that the more you read, the better you are in everything. The more you read for pleasure. Uh, you're better at reading, you're better at writing, you're better at spelling, okay? Everything that counts in language. You don't get better by speaking more. Isn't that interesting? More speaking does not mean better speaking. That's what the research says again and again. More reading, more listening, more comprehensible input. Now, I discovered this 45 years ago, before some of you were born, okay? It's still traditional in classes. I know this. There are many wonderful, beautiful classes, but not very many people are doing this. I visited classes. I have looked at catalogs of courses, and it's all traditional, 100%. <clears throat> why have I failed? I know why. I'll tell you why. There's several reasons. <clears throat> How do you find out about comprehensible input? How do you learn about it? It's very difficult to find out. It's buried in journals. It's buried in books. And it's written by people who don't know how to write. I find their articles nearly incomprehensible. When they, I read all the research, and it's very hard to understand. It's not your fault. Not at all. Poor writing, okay? What they do is they tell you more than you need to know. Page after page, somebody said, if you want to know the time, you don't want someone to tell you how wristwatches are made, okay? And that's what people do over and over. So the articles are long and they're incomprehensible. The reason they're incomprehensible, if you are a scholar and people understand what you write, you get no respect. It has to be difficult, what we call torturous prose. And if people don't understand you, you won't get criticized. Then you can write all the nonsense you want and people will think you're wonderful. There was a beautiful uh, paper written years ago. It was about um, a character called Dr. Fox. Got to tell you about Dr. Fox. Young professors at the University of Southern California were asked to create a series of classes on medical education. What they did, this is wonderful, they hired a professional actor. Now, the professional actor had appeared in movies and television as a doctor. Not class one actor, but class two. But his face was familiar. So they introduced him as a medical expert to give a talk on medical education. They gave him a script that was clear, total nonsense. It made no sense. But this was a professional actor. He did a magnificent job. He was funny. He was lively. He pointed to things. There were figures, formula, but it was complete nonsense. The faculty said it was the best lecture of the year. You see what I'm saying? If they don't understand it, they think it must be wonderful. So the articles are too complicated. Nobody can understand it. It's not your fault. Number two, we're going to solve these problems, and it's going to be good for you. Just wait. Number two, <clears throat> the journals. <clears throat> excuse me, I need more coffee. Oh, gosh. The books and the journals are very expensive. A, a textbook today is, in American money, $50, $80. The technical books are like 150 American. I don't write books anymore because nobody can afford them. The prices are too high. I don't subscribe to professional journals. I can't afford them. You want to subscribe, so let's say, to the Modern Language Journal, language learning, it's 50, 80, $100 a year. Nobody I know can afford this. The only people who can do this are university professors who have access to a university library and they'll give you the articles for free. If you're not in that position, you cannot read the research. So it's too expensive and it's incomprehensible. 
So what do we do about it? We're going to change it, you and I, okay? I'll tell you what I'm doing. All of my papers, number one, are what we call open access. That's today's new vocabulary word, open access. They're in journals that are free to the writer, free to the reader. And you can download the articles and read them and you can share them with your friends. My articles are available for free on my website. My website is sdcrashen.com, sdcrashen.com. My books are there. My articles are there. Don't ask for my permission. You can download it and you can share it. You can share my writing with anyone except, of course, Donald Trump. Don't send it to him, okay? <laughs> he won't I promise. Read it. Yeah, he won't read it anyway, <laughs> okay? So that's the cure. My colleagues and I are all publishing open access free. Scientific knowledge should be for everybody for free, like vaccinations against COVID. In the United States, they're free. I think that's wonderful. If something is for the common good, it should be available for free. So if you get things for free, share them. This is the new way. Otherwise, our profession is dead. No one can learn anything because the prices are now so unbelievably high. Also, I am on Twitter. My name on Twitter is S. Krashen. On Twitter, I advertise my new papers and the new open access papers of my colleagues. Okay. Um, the, the, uh, there's my former student, his name is Jeff McQuillan, has a website called Backseat Linguist. Well, you know, when you're driving, there's someone sitting in the back who tells you how to drive, turn left, go right. So he does that, and he does that too. So I advertise his work all the time and the work of many of my colleagues. So take advantage. If you are a scholar, please do this. I know if you're a scholar, you have to publish in important publications. You can do that, but also do some open access papers so I can read them. Otherwise, I can't read them. So our profession is dying because of the greed of publishers, in my opinion. Okay, so that's my opening remarks. This is why, uh, this is what the theory is. It says, read a lot for pleasure. Listen, don't worry, don't get, don't worry about error correction, all these things. Oh, I want to tell you some great advice I got. Um, I have a friend named Steve Kaufman. You should read all of his stuff. He's so good. He's a polyglot. K-A-U-F-M-A-N. Steve Kaufman speaks like 20 languages. He's really good. Um, he was a businessman, did a lot of traveling. So he learned lots of languages this way. And I also consider him to be my therapist in language. He gives a lot of good advice and I always listen to what he says. By the way, I know he's good. Uh, when he came to Southern California once, we went to dinner in a, a Spanish restaurant and uh, he and I both spoke Spanish to the waiter, of course. And I thought he was really, really excellent. He did very well. I have heard him speak in public, in French, terrific. When I was at the foreign language convention once, he and I and my Chinese teacher went to lunch with other Chinese teachers. And they were amazed at how well he spoke Mandarin. This is what Steve says. Don't worry about making mistakes. Nobody cares. Isn't that fantastic? Yeah. We're more interested in what you are going to say. And I learned this when I was invited to Cuernavaca, Mexico. And I was invited to stay there for a week and go to some classes and give a series of lectures. And all of my friends, the people I knew were Spanish teachers. And we met for lunch and dinner every day. And it was all charlar just talking and gossiping. And, you know, Spanish, I have not acquired the late acquired rules. I make mistakes with ser and estar all the time, I'm sure. <laughs> I'm gradually getting the idea, but okay. And I listened to Steve Kaufman, and I decided not to worry about my mistakes. It was wonderful. <laughs> we talked like old friends and gossiped. 
and I'm sure I improved, okay? And I had a much better time. I got more input, et cetera. So this is my major, major message today. Um, it comes through input, not through speaking, and it's going to take time until we reach everybody because of this expense. Now, you and I, Ustedes and I, are going to solve this problem, all of us. We are going to read open access papers, and we are going to share them. There are some illegal groups that will give you my books for free. If you find them, good. <laughs> Do them. No one's going to buy them anyway, okay? And, if, you know, they're, they're just too expensive. So if you find groups like this, do it with my blessing. All this stuff, we have got to change the world, and we've got to begin right away. Otherwise, our profession is dead, and it's dying more every day. But if we have 10 people who are doing this, it will spread, it will multiply, okay? Okay, there are other questions that you may have. Let me try to anticipate uh, what they are. I know that uh, Patricia's main interest is in drama. So let me talk about that a little bit, okay? All right, yes. That's the topic today, too. Yeah, that's the topic. But um, of course, I think drama is wonderful. How could you not like that? Drama is literature. The, if you, by the way, I, I not only want to help you with teaching and acquiring language, I want to help your social life. I haven't changed the subject. If you want to be popular at parties, I have the formula for you, and it has to do with drama, okay? If you are invited to a party and you don't know the people there, here's what you do. Go watch the last three movies, the popular ones, okay? Then find someone to talk to and say, have you seen Terminator 25? <laughs> okay, whatever. Okay. And someone will say yes. And you will have a conversation. And you will have a conversation that is worthy of a literature class. Because good movies, movies are wonderful. The people who do movies, my favorite now is Avatar. You know the Avatar movies? Yeah. Okay, I'm going to brag now. One of my best friends invented the language for Avatar. Isn't that wonderful? His name is Paul Fromer, and we talk all the time. He was a linguistics student and faculty member, and I think it is brilliant. If you can go to YouTube and get Paul Fromer, F-R-O-M-M-E-R, and hear him talk about how he invented the language. It's a beautiful discussion of linguistics and show business combined. Anyway, you'll have a great conversation because good movies are good literature. So this is a wonderful way of doing it. The value, I think, of doing drama in class is not rehearsing the play. Yes. It's practicing it, working on it, discussing the meaning, that and reading other things like it. Because drama today is drama, television, soap opera, wonderful literature. Uh, by the way, the best soap opera in the world is Korean. You know that, right? If you ever go on an airplane, you usually have Korean soap opera and you have subtitles. I don't care. You know, when I go to movies and watch TV, I'm a real macho man. You know, I like when there are car crashes and fights and lots of blood and uh, unnecessary violence. But these soap opera, these dramas are about people and they're beautiful. They're very insightful. So I am all in favor of using it in class as an example of literature. And I'm all in favor of plays, in favor of good television drama and film. It's great literature. So this is a wonderful direction. Uh, I saw an interview, by the way, with Peter Ustinov. Peter Ustinov, a British actor, died a few years ago. Oh, he was so good. My goodness. If he was in a film, I would go see it. He was that good. He was in French movies. I am now going to, I've switched topics and I'll tell you why. He was in French movies <clears throat> and his French in the movies was really good. French people say his accent is perfect. P 
Peter Ustinov said in the interview, when I'm in a French movie, my accent is great. In real life, if I meet someone from France and we speak French, I have an accent. That changed my life. I'm, I'm approaching another topic now, which I think is very important. And it'll only take five minutes, okay? I had a conversation <clears throat> when I was teaching English years ago, 50 years ago in Ethiopia. And the guy I talked to was from the British Council. And he was telling me about studying French in high school, in the secondary school. And he said, we had to take a final examination. We had to speak French in front of our teachers. For a teenage boy, this is torture. He hated French. He hated the class. He hated the teachers. <clears throat> he hated French culture because of this experience. So he decided to get revenge. He decided to insult and humiliate the teachers. He started out by <clears throat> dressing French. He had a little hat, like a beret, and he came with a glass with a red liquid in it, pretending it was wine. And he exaggerated his French accent so it would sound ridiculous. He said, ah, bonjour mes amis, je suis très content d'être ici avec vous, hein? comment ça va aujourd'hui? Hein? And you know what their reaction was? You sound great. <laughs> Why didn't you do that in class? Okay. <clears throat> he couldn't because accent, here's my final point today, is a marker of membership of a club. Accent tells people who you are. It's like clothing, tells people what group you, you belong to. So we can never teach accent. No. We acquire it and we acquire it perfectly. Isn't that amazing? Every one of you here, inside you, <clears throat> has a perfect American accent. Absolutely. You don't use it because it doesn't feel like you. You don't feel like a member of the club. My conclusion, we acquire language perfectly. The language acquisition device never shuts off. We can do it when we're 60, 70, 80, 90. It's always there. We don't use it because we feel uncomfortable. When I meet someone from London, I don't use a British accent. I can. All of us in the United States can to some extent, but I feel foolish. It's not me. Don't worry about it. I'm making a theoretical point. We can all acquire a language perfectly. We just don't do it, and for pretty good reasons, I think. Well, that is my exactly 30-minute message today. Well, what is very important, it is very important what you have said, because sometimes there are courses who tell us to be able to, to, to follow a, a specific course um, because you will be able to speak uh, English with an accent. Huh? And uh, we yeah. won't be able to speak English uh, with an English accent because we were not born there. And well, we should be you, proud of our accent. There. You don't need to be born there. You need to have friends. And but anyway. Like a member uh, of the group. Yes, but I think that uh, you should be proud of your accent. There is yeah. no need to imitate others. Hmm? Yeah, there because is no need to do it, uh, absolutely. I have looked at the research, of course, that's all I do is look at research, on accent courses. Do they work? No. All they can do is help you make a change in one or two sounds if you're thinking about it. I will tell you one more story. I was invited to go to the home of a very wealthy businessman here in Los Angeles. They picked me up in a chauffeur, you know, they drove me to his home. This man had immigrated to the United States from Germany, and he had a very slight German accent. He wanted to get rid of his accent. Not for communication, he communicated perfectly, okay? But he wanted to sound more authentic. I told him what I just told you. I can't teach it to you. It doesn't work that way. It's group membership. He was insulted and angry, and he told me, leave. I said, look, what if I told you I could give you a computer, 
we could record you speaking and compare the sound, you know, the spectrograph to a native speaker and you can make the match. He said, yes, that's what I want. No, it doesn't work that way. Your accent is, he already had the accent. He just didn't want to use it and for a very good reason. So this is going to be a long time. The people who are doing accent improvement are making a lot of money and they're not getting results. Yeah, it's true. Old story. It's true. Yeah. You can improve your pronunciation, but not your accent. Accent you is yours. You can't even improve your pronunciation very much. I wouldn't no, worry about it. It's already there. Just relax. Yes, no problem. So that, that's very good advice. Now, um, can I ask another question? Please. No extra well, chance. Uh, the thing is that, uh, talking about grammar, let's connect grammar with speaking. You know that uh, we have four macro abilities, and uh, some of them are relegated to a secondary place or they are ignored. In the case of, of speaking, speaking hasn't got its place really. So the students do not have the opportunity to practice speaking in class. The thing is that they may know a lot about grammar, but they are not able to use it in real life situations. Why? Because there is no connection between the grammar they learn and the use in real life uh, situations. So I think that it, it is a problem of the traditional way of teaching English. The students know a lot about grammar, but how can they apply that knowledge you know, in a situation that is common to okay. them in their lives? They cannot apply that knowledge. They can practice for the next hundred years and it won't help. It must be acquired through listening and reading. Conscious learning does not become acquired knowledge. But if they relax and get lots and lots of input, whether they speak or not, they'll get better in their accent, they'll get better in their fluency. Um, I'll tell you a story. Uh, Werner Leopold, famous expert in bilingual education, had two daughters. I'll tell you about his second daughter. When He always spoke German to his daughters, always. And for his second daughter, they had moved to Los Angeles, and he always spoke German to her. She always answered in English, never in German, always. They, they had a perfect father-daughter relationship. They would do things together, have long talks. He spoke German, she answered in English. Everything was wonderful. When she was 17 years old, the family went to Germany for the first time. The first evening there, they went to a party. She met a very nice young man. He was amazed to hear this beautiful English come out of her mouth. It was already there. Now, the same thing is true of me. I, I never speak other languages. I speak to Fidel for, you know, two minutes, once a week, that's all. But when I have to speak the languages, and my, my good languages are French and German, um, it's there. I don't have to worry about it. I, I may speak German once every 10 years. But I do read a lot of German, okay? That's for sure. Same thing with French. And it's fine. It comes. My accent is okay. With German, sometimes people think I'm a native speaker. Not from practice. Not from speaking. From, in my case, from the re reading and all the listening I did already. Their grammar, study, the grammar that you study will never be there for you in speech. It's going to come from listening and reading. So this is the mistake we are committing at the moment because the focus is on grammar and the students need exposure, as you have said, comprehensible input. Thank you. Exactly, exactly right. And it's, yeah. we're making very slow progress. I'm sorry. Yes, yes. But uh, in the end, I think that we will be able to realize that this is not the way. Um, well, uh, um, another question is related to uh, the paralinguistic and nonverbal language that is also present when we are uh, having a conversation. This, uh, this important information is usually ignored, and I think that it is very important in order to convey meaning. What is your opinion about it? Do you think it oh, is important? Yes. I agree. Body language, gestures, pictures, all those things. They yeah. make input more comprehensible. That's why they're good. Now, there is a controversy, and we will settle that controversy right now. People say, uh, it really is dangerous <clears throat> to rely on extra linguistic information because sometimes it says the wrong thing. Here's the example they use. Let's say I'm speaking English to you and I say, uh, it's over there. 
when I do this. Now, what does that mean? Does it point in a direction? Yeah, but it could mean finger. It could mean hand. You don't know. So it doesn't always give you the right answer. But you know what? It usually does. Mm -hmm. The studies show that mo more than half the time, the paralinguistic information, in this case, about 60% of the time, it helps. About 30% of the time, it doesn't matter. <laughs> it, it's neutral. S less than 10% of the time, it's what we call misdirective. It pushes you in the wrong direction. In general, very good news, paralinguistic information is helpful. But it's not only one time. You've got to see it again and again and again. And gradually, you get the idea. This must be true. Context helps us. Cool. It must be true. Otherwise, we would never acquire language. So this kind of information is extremely helpful. It's extremely powerful. Yes. And besides, when we are speaking, sometimes, depending on the message we want to convey, um, uh, paralinguistic information is more powerful than the meaning of the words themselves. That's why students, I use drama. And through drama, my students get a lot of information through nonverbal language. Because body language is not taught in the mother tongue either. And I think that it is very important because the students need to know how to express feelings without speaking. Because there we are conveying a lot of information with the words. The, the students know how to do it. We simply have to give them permission and encouragement. <laughs> yes, it's true. That's, that's it. That's why creativity should be present in the classroom so that we let the students do, let the students be, to be creative. Because the idea is to let them use the language naturally. Mm? And they'll do so, it if they feel comfortable. That's yeah. fine. Yes. And well, yes. Well, when the students are, are, are using drama, and uh, they are being creative, motivation is out of the question. They, they, they get engaged easily. Mm? And, and the, the thing teacher is to, has to feel comfortable doing it and do it a lot. Of course. That's she's the first to show her passion. Different. Otherwise, if she's not a passionate uh, teacher, she won't be That's able right. to, to, to show that passion for learning. And well, finally, the, the, the last question, do you think that uh, listening, well, I think that you do, Everybody knows that listening is a neglected skill. It's, it's not taken into account because of this pause that grammar has uh, in the classroom. Remember that we learn the language and we do not acquire the language. I, I mean the English language. So it is another problem we are having at the moment. There is no uh, enough exposure to, uh, to English in natural situations. So it's, it's difficult for the students to sharpen their ears. Okay, with the grammar issue. Let me talk about that a little bit. Great, great comment. Uh, I am accused of being anti-grammar. I am accused of saying no grammar ever. Teach grammar, go to jail. It's against the law. It's evil. Not my position. My position is it's very hard to teach grammar. And it's very hard to use grammar if you're having a conversation. For example, if you want to use grammar, you got to know the rule and we don't know the rules. Even Noam Chomsky doesn't know all the rules, okay? We're still discovering them. You've got to have time to apply the rules, okay? And you've got to be thinking about grammar. Very hard to do. Yeah. So my position is it's not illegal. It's simply very, very difficult. And I must say, I got interested in becoming a language teacher because I love grammar. Then you change your mind. <laughs> it, well, I still love it. I still. But anyway. But it doesn't mean you have to use it. It's a hobby, okay? Yeah. And it's fascinating. It's a subject. And I still think Noam Chomsky is wonderful, right? Yeah. He's the true master, no question. And it does tell you a little bit about language acquisition, that these rules can't be learned. They have to be acquired. The language acquisition device, Chomsky, I think, was absolutely correct. But that doesn't mean you have to teach it. Yes, yes. A little we bit. Are prepared. Sorry. I'll tell you one more story about grammar. When I was a, a linguistics professor, the man with the office next to mine was a grammar expert. His name was Masayoshi Shibatani. He was an expert in Japanese grammar. He did his dissertation in that. He was also knew more about English grammar than anybody I knew. And I would also always talk to him when I needed information about English grammar. Now, 
Dr. Shibatani uh, spoke English extremely well and his written English was perfect. When he spoke English, he occasionally forgot the third person singular. Masayoshi Shibatani knew that rule since he was 10 years old. He knew more about English grammar than anybody in California. <laughs> and he's still, was he, he, he's too. No, that's, that's not, we just have to relax and not worry about occasional mistakes. Yes, we have to relax, especially today, because English is used as the lingua franca, and you know that mistakes are welcome because uh, right. not all the speakers around the world can uh, know the, the grammar of English perfectly well. They commit mistakes, right. but they communicate. That's the important thing. What is important That's is meaning, important. not grammar. Okay, right. I think that you have given us very important information, and you have answered all the questions. Now we have a better idea, and this is very important because it comes from an expert. Mm? Uh, we are trying to teach the way uh, innovative teachers here in Argentina are trying, to, are trying to change the way English is taught. Less emphasis to, to grammar and more emphasis to fluency. Accuracy is still very important here in Argentina. Input, input, input. Input, input, input is important. Yes, you are right. So thank you very much for your information. It has been very insightful, so I hope that uh, many teachers will follow your advice so that uh, students will be grateful because sometimes they complain about grammar and they are, yes, they are right. For good reasons. <laughs> yes. For good reasons, of course. <laughs> okay. Okay. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. Pleasure for me too. Thank you so much.